Oh. All right, well, thank you everyone for coming tonight to Blarney Books. You're not too late. Grab yourself a seat. Get comfortable. Glad you could come. So, uh, firstly, I'd like to say a huge welcome to Eliza Henry Jones. It is very, very nice to have authors come down this way, especially travelling hours and hours and hours to make it. So, thank you very much, Eliza, for coming. Thank you. I've um, made the executive decision to move in. This is like the coolest bookshop I've ever been in. <laughs> It's lovely. So, Joe gave a very brief overview, but for the formal introduction, we can say that Eliza Henry Jones is an author, a freelance writer, a PhD candidate, and a flower farmer. Example here Eliza has bought these beautiful flowers, king proteas, as well as regular proteas, and white myrtle? White myrtle. <laughs> beautiful. Her previous novels have been listed for multi multiple literary awards, including the ABIA, Australian Book Industry Award of the Year, New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards and the Queensland Literary Awards. Her work has also been published widely, appearing in publications such as The Guardian, Country Style, The Big Issue and The Age. Eliza has qualifications in psychology as well as grief, loss and trauma counselling. So we are so excited to have you here, Eliza. Thank now, you. Eliza's newest book, Salt and Skin, if you haven't seen it and if you haven't gotten a hold of it yet, you really need to get your hands on it because it has the most evocative writing. It has a beautiful Scottish island setting, very remote, very rugged, and uh, it's got a little hint of magic, mystery and witchcraft as well. So, Eliza, I absolutely adored this book. I was up very late on, I think, Thursday night and I... I had at least a quarter of it to go and it was well past my bedtime at that stage. But I thought, oh, I'll be able to put it down and then, of course, you know, I couldn't. So I stayed up very late finishing it and absolutely lapping it up because it is beautiful writing. But for those who haven't picked it up yet, Eliza, can you please give everyone a nutshell description of the book? Oh, this is really hard, actually. <laughs> uh, so... Basically, Salt and Skin is a contemporary magical realist novel and it follows the story of the Manigan family. And Luda Manigan is recently widowed and she and her two teenage children move from their drought-stricken farm in Australia where she's been um, documenting and raising awareness around climate change to some remote Scottish islands that are based on the Orkneys. And very soon after arriving, Luda takes a photo of a cliff collapsing um, and a child unfortunately dies in that collapse and she sees it very much as part of her job to put that image into the public space. She sees it as being really important to the cause of climate change and it obviously really distresses and... Um, angers the local community and she and her two children are ostracised. And it's a bit of a funny book because I really do draw on a lot of the folklore of the Northern Isles. There's a lot of Selkie stuff woven in and um, there's also a lot of references to the 17th century Orkney witch hunts. Which I think, um, for people that haven't come across magical realism... How, how do you generally explain magical realism? Because I think it's handled so beautifully and so lightly in here that it's, it's very easy to suspend your belief and, and to take those different things in without going, OK, we've entered a completely different stratosphere here. How do you generally explain? Um, I mean, sometimes I, I refer to my work as being fantastical because magical realism is really most closely associated with um, a particular generation of South American writers such as um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Elizabeth Allende. I think I just mispronounced her name. Um, so that kind of intersection, whatever you call it, I conceptualise as being realism with a liminality that, that incorporates the fantastical. So in Salt and Skin, there's references to these witchcraft um, trials. There's references to magic and ghosts and selkies, but there's also a liminality and a, almost a blurriness there. And it's almost up to the reader to decide the origins and the explanations behind these um, subjects in the book. Yeah, and um, one of the things that I found really fascinating was uh, when the people were on this particular island. Now, in my head, I'd called it Shawnee Island. It might Spot be, on. It is? Oh, there we go. So... Um, 
they've got this um, luminescence and you can see people's scars on their skin as well, which was really interesting because some people could see them and some people couldn't. And one of the characters makes this um, suggestion on why some people can see them and some people can't. I found that really fascinating as well because I could imagine those characters, you know, looking at them and seeing the different... It's not something you generally think of, do you? Looking at someone and imagining every cut or bruise they've ever had or scrape on their skin. But as you're, you're reading the book and you're really in that character's mind, you can almost imagine that everyone's walking around with those scars on display. Mm. So I thought that was quite a really interesting way of, of getting that magical realism in there as well with that little aspect. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'll say this up front. I got some Hannah Kent vibes from this book. And is there anyone in the audience that enjoys Hannah Kent's stories, Burial Rites, we've got Devotion, um, what was the one about the fairy? The Good People. The Good People. So I thought there was some really, and it's, I, I hope you take that as a compliment because I find like she is a, a fantastic writer and Adelaide based, but um, is this a comparison that you've had made often or is this um, just the fact that this has such beautiful themes and that, you know, magic in there? I've been – it's been compared quite a lot to Hannah's work, which I will, I will take. I'm yeah. here for it. Um, it's also been compared a bit to Lucy Trelaw, who's another writer that I really love, and um, Sarah Moss. So I'm, I'm you know, <laughs> keep them coming, really. Um, <laughs> um, and Hannah actually recently read it and did a lovely post on Instagram, which made me very, very happy. Um, and I was on a panel with her at Melbourne Writers Festival, which was really cool too. Oh, but that is fantastic. Yeah, her, her work is just phenomenal. It is, it is. And Lucy Trelaw actually provided the cover quote for this. So if anyone was around for the fabulous Port Ferry Literary Weekend that we had not that long ago, thank you, Joe. Uh, Lucy did a really great talk on a panel. And one of the things that Lucy particularly spoke about was setting and how setting becomes one of the main characters in the book. I found certainly when I was reading through Salt and Skin, there's that real fact that, it, that those islands and the rugged um, coast, here in Port Ferry, we know all about rugged coasts, don't we? I mean, they're not quite as rugged, I'm, I'm sure, as, as Scotland, but I was certainly feeling like with that wind that forms the trees and, um, you know, the shipwrecks and things like that. I know that you had a residency in, in Ireland as well and you actually got to explore where you've set the book. Was that a really key pivotal moment in deciding to set the book around there or, or did, the, did you decide to set it and then you went to visit? Which, which way did it go? Um, it's actually a bit, of a bit of a weird story. I um, went, and went to my mailbox one day and a really good writer friend of mine, Sandra Lee Price, had sent me The Outrun by Amy Liptrot, which is this absolutely beautiful memoir um, charting Amy's experience of addiction and basically her moving from, I think she was in London, um, back to her childhood home on the Orkney Islands and just throwing herself into the landscape and the natural world and just incrementally moving herself further and further out until she's on like a tiny little island off a tiny little island <laughs> off one of the smaller islands in the Orkneys. And my friend sent it to me because she thought that the addiction side of things would really pique my interest, which it did. That was my job before I started writing full time. Um, but I was just absolutely enchanted by the descriptions of landscape and place. And I have always been really drawn to quite um, mild sort of, you know, tropical places, you know, forests and palm trees and mild water and white sand. And I decided that I had to get to the Orkney Islands. So I um, dragged my husband with me and he quite likes wild places, but um, when we arrived there, we couldn't even get the doors of the hire car open. And he's just <laughs> looking at me like, I'm happy, but wh why did you want to come here? Um, and I didn't even take my laptop with me because I was feeling a little bit burnt out from writing. Um, and while we were there, we did a lot of tours. And one of the tours we did was of St Magnus Cathedral, which is this absolutely beautiful cathedral that they began building in 1137. And it's in the centre of Kirkwall, which is the capital of the Orkney Islands. And while we were there, we saw um, the dungeon, which is like this hole high up in the wall um, that can only be accessed by a ladder um, called Marek's Hole. And they also had the double hangman's ladder in, um, just lying on its side, like 
you'd see in someone's garage um, that was actually used in the executions of those accused of witchcraft in the 17th century. And it's so funny that I'd sort of gone to have this break from writing and um, I just became absolutely entranced by the, st the stories of the women and how fragmented and incomplete those records were. Um, in a lot of cases, the Kirk records that outlined their interrogation and their um, court cases was actually the most detailed remaining records of their day-to-day -day lives, which is pretty horrifying. Um, and I think it was 90% of those accused of witchcraft in the Orkney Islands were women. And so I was just really interested in the stories of the women and their lives, but also how do you make sense of a space like that Kirk that is such an active part of the community? You know, people are going there for worship, they're going there to get married, have christenings, and that would have been true too when there were people being, you know, incarcerated in this, you know, open hole in the wall up above the main body of the Kirk. You know, how do we make sense of those spaces and what does climate change mean mm. to how we make sense of them? And so I didn't realise that a kirk was actually a church hmm. um, until I was Context. reading the book. <laughs> and so I found that fascinating that, um, that, yes, you've got these places of worship, but they are such um, dire places as well. Now, you've, you've got, and I'll get to it a little bit later, there's, there's a particular bit about the end that I want to talk about with no spoilers. Oh. This is a spoiler-free zone. Let me just say that right up front. Um, but that... Um, that place becomes a, a very pivotal part of the book, the Kirk, the church. Um, so did you draw on that specific location of the, of the place that you actually visited as well? For that? Because I could imagine as soon as you were saying that, to, that you could see the hole in the wall where they used to put the people, um, it, it, yeah, usually the women that are incarcerated. It's amazing, isn't it, to think that, you know, you've still got these buildings that you can go and visit and then draw from to re recreate for people like like us that are in Port Ferry that have never been to one of these amazing buildings before? I definitely based the setting in the book on the places that I visited in the Orkneys, but it felt a bit too presumptuous to actually call it the Orkney Islands because I took so many ridiculous, wild deviations from the story. And, you know, that was something I had to really grapple with because even though they're people that have been, you know, dead for a very long time, it's still the stories of real people and real people's traumas and, you know, what did I owe them? What did I owe their stories? What what did I have the right to actually draw into for the purposes of creating fiction? Um, and uh, your question was about the place. Yeah, so, so it was a, a direct, um, you know, when you were... At the ah, place yes, researching, yes, yes. were you taking yes. photographs or were you I writing down notes? I mean, I took a few photographs, but again, I hadn't really thought of it as a research trip. I was just going on a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I really, I really, I did just kind of take little snaps of things that kind of caught my interest. But it was an interesting process in a way because I think I would have approached the place very differently if I had gone there thinking I need to research this, I need to document it. And in a way it was these little little snippets and little tiny things that I thought were beautiful or fascinating that ended up shaping the whole arc of this story. Um, it's a little bit backwards in a way. And I think I was also quite interested in terms of, you know, these objects and sites from this long ago violence and trauma existing in contemporary settings, but also the way that I think we view ourselves as having moved on and grown since those times, and that I think we view that kind of very punitive reaction to people that are different or vulnerable or othered or whatever as being, you know, something that doesn't happen now. And I really wanted to examine the ways that those sort of cycles of trauma and violence perpetuate across centuries and across generations and that, you know, the sites and the objects often remain pivotal, um, or certainly did in Salt and Skin. Yeah. And now speaking of vulnerable people, um, one of the very interesting characters throughout the story is Theo and his full name, Theo Finn. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it, but when I'm reading it, it's written Theo Finn. Now, for people in the audience that haven't read the book yet, Theo is a chap that's washed up on the shores 
of the island. No one knows where he's come from. And the whole book kind of gathers around, um, part, of, part of the plot gathers around the search to try and find out his origins. And he's, some people think that he's a selkie, so that he's a washed up fairy, a merman type of, type of creature. Can you tell us a little bit about Theo, please? He's one of my favourite... I think he's one of the, my most favourite characters that I've ever written. I got a bit grief-stricken when I sent off the final edits for this <laughs> book. Um, so Theo is this boy that washed up, yes, with no memory, and a lot of the local community sort of do think that he might be a Selkie. And for those unfamiliar, a Selkie is a seal person. So it's this folkloric tradition that emerged out of the Northern Isles, so Orkney, Shetland, that kind of region, and also Ireland. And what's really unique about the Selkie folk tales is the fact that there's a real gentleness to them that's missing in a lot of other kind of oceanic tales, you know, compared to the Kraken or Sirens, you know, where there's this real thread of violence and vitriol. Um, you know, Selkies were the seals when they were in water and then they'd shed their skin to come on the land and dance. And in a lot of the stories, um, a man will then take the skin of normally the Selkies that emerge are women. A man will take her skin and trap her into marriage and childbearing and life on the land. And all the while she is yearning for the sea. And I was very interested in how Selkies kind of viscerally inhabit this space between human and nature. And, you know, they're, they're on the shore between the water and the sea. And I wanted to write a character that kind of embodied that. Um, and also I just, it was just fun. It was just fun to write him. Um, and again, you know, there's, there's possible other explanations for how he sort of turned up there, but I like to think that he was a selkie. Yeah, and he has these webbed hands and, and in a lot of the book he's trying so hard to rid himself of this, I guess, remain, uh, reminder, a visual reminder of, you know, something that keeps the conversation going about where he's from and, and what he is. So that poor boy, I felt for him because uh, you wrote that so beautifully. And look, speaking of using the five senses, the very lovely Jock Sarong is in the audience at the moment. And I remember attending a writing workshop with Jock many years ago. And he talked about using the five senses. And uh, I might be butchering this completely, Jock, but my memory of it is that you said that once you've written the book, you'll go through and you'll do a pass, just looking specifically for smell. And then you go through the, the draft again and you'll look specifically for where you've referenced touch. Now, is this something that comes naturally to you as you're writing it or do you go through later and layer in and just check that you've got all those five senses? Um, I can see that in your work, Jock. <laughs> Love it. Um, I, I think every writer has things that come more easily to them than other things when they sit down to write a story. And I think character and setting are probably what comes most easily to me. Um, and it was a really funny thing, actually, because most of Salt and Skin was written during the Melbourne lockdowns when I couldn't even get to Port Phillip Bay and put my sad little pale feet in the shore there. You know, it was... I was completely landlocked. And so it almost became this kind of dreamscape to me that I inhabited. And I think... I don't know whether that played into how I kind of evoked place in there. Um, you know, whether I had gotten back to Orkney and written from a little little beachside cottage, whether it would have been a different evocation of place. But um, I think I will probably be going through all of my <laughs> future drafts <laughs> looking for all the five senses. I think it's a great, a great way to do it. Mm. And um, it, I, I quite liked that, thinking of it in, in that respect, to try mm. and make sure that you're thinking not just what you can see, but what you can hear in any particular scene and mm. what, you can, what you can feel when you pick up the things, just like we're talking about, you know, that webbed finger with the bloody matted skin and the smell of iron. So I, I think you certainly do it instinctively as well, but it is interesting to try and work out at what stage that kind of comes in mm. and comes together. Yeah, plot, plot and um, just fitting it all together is probably what I have to be most conscious of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm writing and editing and revising. Yeah, beautiful. Um, now, one of the other main characters, Luda, she is the mother that kind of... Um, the whole story almost revolves around her, I guess, in respect. Now, some of the time she seems like quite the self-absorbed mother who she just can't help documenting, photographing, everything that she sees, for better or for worse, and she just doesn't seem to know 
um, exactly how that's going to impact everyone else around her. She's very fixated on her work in these images. But she loves her family dearly and this keeps coming back time and time again throughout the story because we get to see multiple perspectives from different characters. Was it quite the balancing act, Eliza, to try and get that, um, you know, to really show that she is very focused on what she's doing but she also is very loving? So she seems to cross these lines without even meaning to but you do feel sympathetic to her and you can understand how she finds it a struggle. Was that something that you found easy to write? Really, really difficult, really difficult. Luda was the most difficult part of writing this book, I think, because I think, in general, our tolerance for complex, difficult women in fiction is pretty low. Mm -hmm. um, and we're not good at sitting with women that do bad things but still have redeeming qualities. And trying to strike that balance between her doing things that are objectively pretty poor um, but still have a thread that you can connect with and hopefully resonates with people as they read was really was a struggle and um, she was actually tempered a lot during the editing process she was um, she was a bit more abhorrent <laughs> in the earlier drafts um, and I think as well just writing someone in general that is grappling with motherhood and a cause like raising awareness around climate change. I mean, that's a pretty big thing for her to juggle. And, you know, does something as catastrophic as climate change justify putting images of someone else's child in their final moments out into the world? And, you know, Luda actually had pre previous form. And back when she was in Australia, she took a photo of her son Darcy when he was lying looking very anguished in a cracked, dry dam bed, and she assumed that he was, you know, distressed about the effects of climate change and the drought on, on their community, but it turns out he was actually distressed about something else, which you can piece together as a narrative progresses, but for her, she took that photo, didn't tell him about it, sent it off to um, the tabloids, and it sort of became a bit of a rallying point for the, the cause, and for her... It does justify it, but, you know, does does something like climate change justify it? You know, how do parents navigate the boundaries between what's public and private for their children? Does something being beautiful um, matter enough to transgress those boundaries? Does climate change matter enough? So, I don't know the answer, but they're sort of some of the things that I was grappling with when I was pulling Luda together. And I think you did it really well because, yes, I can see that um, she would have been a really difficult character to write because she's very complex. And, you know, yourself, you're a mother, you know the type of um, attention and energy and all the different guilt that comes with being a mum and the conflicts of your time versus your mothering and all these different things come into play. So a lot of different things to take care of. Let's jump to sibling relationships. So Luda's children, Darcy and Min, uh, they're both grieving. There's a really strong bond between them. But that bond kind of seems to get a bit fuzzy as well. So um, there was a lot of dialogue that I thought was really well done. That was a very telling part of their relationship. And there's a lot of humour. There's a lot of um, just general sibling banter as well. But how did you get that dialogue right? Do you, are you from a large family? Do you have lots of brothers and sisters or... A, um, or do you just watch and learn and things like that? I'm the only child of a single child, so... <laughs> um, but when I was growing up, I had a lot of other um, children that I've grown up with that I'm still really good friends with, and I think I've kind of based a lot of my understandings of sibling dynamics um, on my relationship with them. Um, but, yeah, it's, uh, it's something that I think can be difficult to write when you haven't experienced it. Um, so I'm glad to hear that it reads okay. <laughs> <laughs> it does. I thought it was really good. And I can see that, um, you know, that real fragility of the bond because they are teenagers and, you know, teenage relationships with anyone are quite fraught with danger. So let alone someone who will kind of put up with it as well. So they, they have that connection. 
Now, in many ways, Tristan, who's another of the characters, he's quite a comedian. Now, I really liked Tristan. He had such a great sense of humour. There were lots of jokes going on um, around him. He could see all the different characters quite clearly. So, they might not have seen themselves as clearly as Tristan saw them, I thought. Um, he knew when to take them seriously. He knew when to poke fun at them. Um, so, where all the characters there at the beginning, so we know that Luda needed pairing back a bit. Is there anyone that needed ramping down or, or bringing up throughout the stages in the editing process? Tristan was actually a later addition. Um, oh, great. I, I just felt like there needed to be someone else there to sort of bind the family together. And um, one of my um, beautiful writer friends, Jessie Cole, um, she's just released her second memoir, Desire, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, but she read it and she she made a comment that, oh, he's, you know, the classic, you know, securely attached character. He's like the only securely attached yeah, yeah. <laughs> character in the book. And um, he almost just offers contrast to the other characters. And, yeah, he, was, he came later on in the piece. Um, I think most of the others were all there, but I just kind of played around with to what extent. Some of the characters had um, larger roles in the earlier drafts and I've really pulled them back to something a lot more peripheral. Um, others I've really built up into something that's more, more well-rounded and complex in the narrative. But yeah, Tristan was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was. And so I certainly also want to stress that <clears throat> the book does deal with some quite deep themes. It's got some serious... So, um, we've got grief and we've got trauma in there. But there's certainly lightness to it as well. So, certainly when you pick up the story, you'll take a lot of different things away from it um, and lightness as well. But I know that you have the background in the, the uh, grief and trauma and, and psychology as well. You handled these issues, I thought, really sensitively, Eliza. It must impact on you having to go to these dark places when you're working on a novel because it's never a quick process to dash out 105,000 words. Uh, how do you personally take care of your own, um, your own self-care whilst you're dealing with and spending a lot of time on the page um, with issues like this? Is this where you go out into the garden and spend some time just cleansing it out or do you have different techniques in place to be able to t talk about stuff like this? Um, I think I would struggle a lot more with writing about these quite heavy themes if they were done in a context that was desolate and dark. Mm. So even though there is a lot of grief and trauma in this book, I it's it's almost um it was almost the only way I could write it. I wrote it in a way that still had warmth and levity and humor in it, and that was how I was able to actually stay in that story world and do the work that needed done. Um, so it wasn't hugely difficult. I think what I found most difficult about writing about those subjects was doing them justice. And one thing I sort of wrote Salt and Skin in reaction to is it's... I mean, I've done it in my previous books, but there's this real tendency to have a traumatised character and the traumatic backstories kind of dangled a little bit at the start and you're like, oh, I want to know what's happened. You know, why are they behaving in this way? What is it? And there's sort of this build-up to a moment where they divulge their trauma to another character and it's this moment of catharsis and growth and they're seen and embraced and they can move on with the rest of their lives. And that isn't my experience of trauma working in the fields I was working in and also personally, you know, I think a lot of the time we don't actually necessarily even know what, a, what the extent of our trauma. We don't have narratives for that trauma. And I wanted the trauma in this book, um, one of the characters in particular, he never articulates what he's been through. You as the reader can piece it together. And I think there's an awareness that the other characters have all pieced together what has happened to him as the story progresses, but he never articulates it. And doing justice to that felt pretty large and there was a lot of tweaking because I think it would probably be a handful of lines in the whole book that you pull that whole very complex story from and just... It was almost like writing a poem, those few lines, just trying to do justice and make sure it communicated what it needed to communicate without um, hitting you over the head with it. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was definitely in my mind when I was working on it. Yeah. 
And so let's move on to some lighter stuff. Now, writing groups. I know you have quite a few friends that are good um, company and they're in different stages of their publication journeys. Can you explain, do you, do you, how did you collect this little posse of uh, writing friends? Or do you have several different groups? I, I'm thinking of the group that you're in with Kylie Orr and I know that um, she, she's got a debut book out this year and you kind of get together. I've seen some photographs of you guys gathering and it looks like a lovely time. Is that, um, how, did, how did your group form? Um, Basically because I'm a massive bossy britches <laughs> and I wanted to be part of a writer's group so I just kind of um, grabbed a few friends who I thought either vaguely knew each other or would get along well and um, <laughs> made them all go away with me for the weekend. <laughs> um, but that's, that's really evolved and um, we probably, we've got like a group chat that we talk on most days which is really nice, particularly through lockdown and it is... We're all at very different stages. Some people um, are working towards getting their first work published um, you know, Kylie Ladd, I think, is publishing number five or six, maybe, in February. Um, but it's it's been really lovely because I think for me, I always wrote for my... It was this very insular activity. Um, I didn't tell anyone I was writing stories and my poor mother um, would, you know, walk into the study and I'd quickly, like, turn the computer off and just give her this, you know, really, like, horrified, betrayed look that she'd walked in while I was working. So I don't know what she thought I was up to. But um, she was very relieved when I kind of presented her with this, like, giant stack of... Um, a4 paper at the end of it so I think it's it's been really lovely and a real revelation to form those connections with other writers and because um, writers are awesome <laughs> um, and to you know share my work at different points of development and read other people's work and um, yeah, it's pretty special. It is, and they're there to cheer you on when you're doing well and you've mm. got a book out and uh, tell their friends about it, which is always good. Um, another thing we did touch briefly on is flower farming. Now, for the people that uh, are here to talk about books, we're going to quick, quickly digress and talk <laughs> about flower farming because uh, Eliza and I both love a bit of green thumb action. So how do you fit flower farming in with your writing? With great difficulty. <laughs> I'm very tired. Um, but I think in a lot of ways, flower farming is such a lovely thing to do alongside writing because it's so cut and dry. You know, you, you plant the seed, you grow the seed, you cut the seed, you sell the plant that it's turned into. And it's it's just so formulaic. And there's something just very soothing about being out in the sun and the weather and the dirt. And it's just, it's a lovely way to sort of get out of my own head which I think sometimes is really vital when you're a writer. And um, also, they're just pretty. <laughs> yeah, they are, they are. The beauty of having a vase or something like this next to you whilst you're writing. I don't know about you, Eliza, but often when I've got a bunch of flowers next to me on my desk and I can't think what the character's going to do next, and I'll look across at this bunch of flowers and I'd admire the way the ranunculus are all kind of curled around each other, the petals, or there'll be a spider dangling there, and I'll think... <gasps> Okay, that's what I could do next. I could have a spider in the room and are they scared of spiders, this character or not? So just little things like that, that just having that vase of flowers there um, will just kind of spark something. Absolutely. And I think, you know, gardening and writing are both activities that require a lot of optimism and hope. You know, <laughs> you set out writing a story in the, in the belief that, you know, you're going to finish that story and it's going to take years and it's going to be a lot of hard work. And I think similarly, you know, you plant a seed and you mm. hope that in, you know, my, you know, maybe it's a few weeks, but, you know, in some cases, you know, you plant things and you think, well, hopefully, you know, in five years I might have a tree or in, you know, four years I might have some protea. So it's, there's a real underpinning of, of yeah, hope that I think is a really lovely thing. Yeah, absolutely. Now, take us back a step. Before children, before fiction books... Um, was there a time before children? <laughs> <laughs> before flower farming, what would 10 or 15-year-old Eliza say about the lady who's sitting in front of me with not one, but did you say five? Several books? Oh, yeah, five books, yeah. Five books. Five books, awards under her belt, um, who goes around travelling to do talks at beautiful bookstores like Blarney Books, talking about books. What would 10 or 15-year-old Eliza, who was typing up her stories on the computer, say about this success? 
think she'd be pretty chuffed. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I didn't, at that age, I didn't even think that, you know, it was a reality to make a living from your writing. And, you know, I think it, it's, it's very, it's a patchwork kind of job. You do a lot of different things, but that sort of adds to the magic of it. But yeah, I'd be very chuffed. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. And can you explain a little bit about your past publication as well? Because I know often at um, our book, book events here at Blarney, there are often people who are writing and dream of one day having a book of their own on the shelves. What was it like for you? So you went from a, a young girl who would write secretly. How did you go to actually getting your first contract? I sort of always viewed it as something that, you know, it takes this much time to actually write the book and I may as well invest this much time at the end and see if something comes of it. And my long-term goal was to hopefully make enough money from my writing to justify having a day, maybe maybe two days a week that I could <laughs> spend writing. And I studied psychology and grief, loss and trauma counselling and was working in... Um, alcohol and other drug sector and I just kind of kept writing on the side because writing is how I had always understood the world. I've never been someone that's kept a journal or um, written about my own experiences really. So how I kind of managed that as quite a wordy, introspective person was writing fiction that involved characters grappling with similar things and it was very cathartic and it get, often gave me a lot of comfort and insight into whatever I was going through. Um, so I kind of just kept trucking along writing and um, then I sent, I sent a manuscript that did not end up getting published to an agent and she liked it and she said, yes, I'll take you on, I'll send it out. And I think one thing you really drummed over the head with as an aspiring writer is that agents are really hard to get. So I kind of thought, I'm going to get published. God, nay, you know, this is it. <laughs> And um, everything moves very glacially in publishing. So I think it was probably seven or eight months later that we'd heard back from all the publishers. And all of them had said, the writing's nice, but, you know, we can't sell this. There's no hook. There's no... There's nothing marketable about this story. And by then I'd sort of written my next one um, and my agent read it and said, well, I think this is probably going to get a similar response. Like, I really like it, but it's very quiet. <laughs> it was called In the Quiet. <laughs> it's a very quiet story. And... Um, so we sent it out and I really wasn't expecting anything and I just busily started working on my next one after work and um, it went out to 10 publishers and it ended up getting five offers um, and I signed a three book deal with HarperCollins and I was 24 at that point so it was pretty, um, pretty, <laughs> Huge. yeah it was absolutely <laughs> astonishing um, and it was also a very difficult process in a lot of ways because I am a very intro introspective person and it had always been this very private thing and then suddenly, you know, you're being interviewed and you're giving talks and people are writing about your work and it felt very revealing in a lot of ways. Um, but I think, you know, I'm very, very fortunate to have had that experience and... I think as well what it really drummed into me is how subjective it is that, you know, if my manuscript had just happened to go to the five people that it didn't connect with it, I just would have put it in the drawer with all the other manuscripts I'd written and not put anything else of it. So just how subjective it is and I think what a big part luck plays in the whole process, you know, getting the right story to the right person at the right time. Mm. But I also think that hard work puts you where good luck can find you which is um, one of those things that you do. You need to have done the work. You need to have written that book. You need to have put months, often years, into putting it down on paper and having it ready and packaged before that publisher can be in the right frame of mind to read it at the right time. So I do like to think that too. Um, writing across genres, because you have um, magical realism. You've got YA as well. Mm. Tell us about writing across different genres, please. Um, in a way, it's a different process. I think the structures are subtly different, the characterizations, the, the the way you kind of draw the story out is subtly different. But I deal with very similar themes in my young adult fiction and I'd say that it's, it's similar in that it's countered by the humour and the warmth and the focus on love and relationships. 
Um, but my YA deals with things like, you know, parental mental illness and parental gambling, homelessness, forced adoption. Um, you know, it's, they're quite they're quite big topics, and it's interesting because I think I really do gravitate to writing about young people. So my debut was written from the perspective of a mother who's died, and she's watching her family on their rural horse property, and it's it's the ways that her family and friends and community kind of move you know move through their grief. Um, and there's a lot of focus on her teenage children and. The YA novels have that focus too, and then Salt and Skin again has that focus on Luda's children. So it is something that I think I'm very drawn to, writing about that sort of um, older adolescent age. Mm. And so can you see yourself moving into like a straight fantasy, like writing outside different genres again? Could you see yourself going to crime or memoir? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not really sure. I mean, I just kind of... I think I've, I've really increasingly understanding the value of writing about what I find really interesting and enjoyable and challenging. So I think whatever, whatever kind of topics and whatever form that takes. But, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's exciting. We, we never know what not might be coming next. <laughs> Um, now, as I said earlier, it is a spoiler-free zone here at Blarney Brooks, <laughs> so I'm not going to give away the ending of the story, but as I said, I stayed up very late finishing this one because I just couldn't put it down. And then when I got to the last page, I went, <gasps> hold on, <laughs> what? Eliza, and it's very late at night, luckily, because I was tempted to call Eliza up and say, how could you end it there? What is the point at which you decide your book is done? So do you write an extra 10,000 words and you cut it off there or do you write um, 5,000 words before that point and cut it off there? How do you decide when it's done? The ending's proving very divisive. <laughs> my neighbour read it and I got this text from her at like 1am just all in caps <laughs> saying, you have ruined my life. Um, but then other people have really, really enjoyed it and it's actually a really weird story because I normally... Normally when I get an idea for a story, I launch straight in. I write very fast, I throw out a lot and I will just keep working on a story until I kind of lose interest in it. Um, I've got no willpower basically. And with Salt and Skin, I became really interested in actually writing this story right after I had my child. So I physically couldn't get to my laptop to type when he was a really tiny baby because he had reflux and he was just really sc screamy and poor baby. Um, so this story just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and I think it was already a pretty um, ambitious, intimidating project to sort of set out on because it does deal with such big issues and it's set somewhere that I'm not as familiar with as Australia and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but by the time I actually was able to sit down and do a little bit of writing, it just seemed absolutely impenetrable and... How I found my way into the story was actually just cracking out good old notes app on my phone at 3 a.m. after feeding. And I wrote 4,000 words of poetry, which is really funny because I'm not a poet um, at all. I don't, I, I love reading poetry, but I don't really write it. And pretty much, almost word for word, the final scene in the finished book is what I wrote at, you know, in the wee hours of the morning. And oh. given that this book, 105,000 words, um, I threw out about 150,000 words from it during the editing process. Ooh, yeah. that hurts. Um, you know, the fact that that, that was always going to be my end point. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> and, and the more I sat with it and thought about it, and I, and I woke up during the night thinking about it as well, <laughs> and then I've actually been really pleased with that ending. <laughs> I, am, I am very pleased with that ending because it gives you room to, to think. And it leaves you thinking about it long after you've finished it as well. So, no spoilers, but... Uh, very there is signposting, I will say. It's subtle, but there is signposting. So, you can kind of work out how it ends beyond the final sentence. So, you can, you can work it. You can sort of piece it together. But, um, yeah, divisive ending. <laughs> Beautiful. I'm going to throw to audience uh, questions in a moment. So, if you've got anything that you'd like to ask Eliza... Please start thinking about what you might like to ask because we'll we'll chat for a little bit more. I have a couple more questions first, but please do get your questions ready. 
Tell us about the most surprising thing that you found when you were working on this novel, Eliza. Was it something in your research process or something you learned about yourself? Um, that I could... I'd have to throw out 150,000 mm. words. <laughs> um, I think when I delved into the Witchcraft Act and the history of the witch trials, uh, that was that was a lot. And just the rates, the stark difference in literacy rates between men and women in Scotland at the time of the witch hunts was really startling. Um, one thing that I found really fascinating, which is kind of a little bit tangential, but I'm going there, um, was the... The markings that are in salt and skin, so protective spells, hexafoils, apotropaic markings, and finding out that these markings were actually scattered all through this cathedral that I was so entranced by. And the idea was that these markings made in stone would ward off ill intent and bad spirits and spells and all of that sort of thing. And there was an overlap with Christian practices, so there'd be some of them would be like a V or an M to invoke the Virgin Mary. Some of them would be these concentric circle patterns to trap the bad spirit. So they just keep walking around and around and around these, these circles. And it's generally accepted that the practice kind of was, had well and truly died out in the, um, across the UK uh, at the time of the 1735 Witchcraft Act. And as we know, colonisation, invasion didn't happen here until 1788. So there was quite a few decades intervening between the end of these practices in the UK and people um, from that part of the world arriving here. But they found that actually people seemed to revert back to those practices when confronted with the communities of people that were already here, confronted with the unfamiliar landscape, confronted with the unfamiliar weather, the animals. Um, and, you know, the season, everything, um, people reverted back to these practices. And um, there's a man called Ian Evans who did a lot of re has done a lot of ongoing research into that, and he thought they were confined to Tasmania, these markings, and he then found that they're actually scattered all through Australia. So um, that really excited me because, for me, they kind of embody this, you know, fear and trauma and environment and history and the fact that they were found in Australia and they're also in this little um, cathedral on an island off the north coast of mainland Scotland was really exciting. Yeah, no, that's really neat. I didn't realise that we had much of it here in Australia either, so mm. there you go. <laughs> now, um, I also wanted to ask you a little bit about Australian book recommendations because you have a, a lovely writing group but you also read really widely and you've got lots of different connections throughout um, different writers in different genres. Can you tell us what you've been reading recently? Um, I have mostly been rereading fantasy books lately because I'm um, my doctorate's due in a couple of weeks and my brain is slowly leaking <laughs> out of my ears. Um, but I did recently read Jock's latest book. <laughs> Settlement, which I absolutely adored. Um, and what else have I read lately? Um, oh, I'm, I am currently reading The Eulogy by Jackie Bailey, which is I'm really enjoying as well. Um, oh, you know, I'm going to be driving home later and all these amazing books are going to pop into my head. Was it Melissa Manning? Ah, Smoke? Oh, Smokehouse by Melissa Manning is really beautiful mm. as well. And she was at the Literary uh, Weekend as well and she mm. did a, a really good talk about short stories here in Blarney Books too. So that one's on the shelf as well, mm. which is good. Um, I've got a fast five. So I'd like to know quickly the first thing that pops into your mind for the answer to these ones. Do you like paperbacks, e-books or audiobooks? Paperbacks. Paperbacks, right. Bookmarks or folded corners? Folded corners. <gasps> Luckily, I gave her a bookmark today. Thank goodness. As your problems are solved, Eliza. <laughs> and sometimes I highlight the pages as well. <gasps> oh, goodness. Goodness. <laughs> we can still be friends. I can, I can overlook that. Do you prefer plotting, writing, editing or promo? Writing. I'm a terrible plotter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I quite like revising as well, but I think writing's the most thrilling experience for me. Mm. 
Music, silence or background noise while you're writing? Music. I've, um, I didn't realise it was a thing, um, but I've actually got synesthesia, so I see like colours with music, so it's very... I have certain songs that I listen to that evoke the right kind of shapes and colours for whatever story I'm working on. Lovely. Um, so what type of music did you listen to whilst writing Salt and Skin? Um, I listened to a lot of Bach, actually, oh, and nice. there was a couple of just random songs that came on shuffle from like movie soundtracks that just mm. fit in perfectly. Um, so I just tend to listen to them on repeat and, yeah, my partner goes, goes slowly, slowly more and more crazy. <laughs> Fair enough. There's some really good playlists on Spotify, mm. like um, Pop Goes Classical. So songs that you know but all done to classical tunes. I've written a fair bit to those songs. They're quite good. Uh, Favourite piece of writing advice? Read, I think, and read really broadly. Um, I think it's easy if you're trying to publish a work or publish multiple works in a particular genre that you feel pressure to just kind of, you can, you can get sort of, um, uh, you can get a bit blinkered and you can get sort of bogged down in just that genre. And I think there is just so much value and joy in just reading absolutely everything you can get your hands on. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Um, now, it is your turn, folks. Um, do we have any questions for the lovely Eliza here tonight? Excellent, we have one from Jane. Now, Jane is speaking a little bit later at seven as well, so I hope you're sticking around for that. What's next? I'm, I'm going to sleep. sleep. <laughs> um, I've, got about, oh, I've got about five books on, that I'm sort of working on, jumping between a little bit, and I haven't settled on which one's going to be my next one yet, um, which I probably need to do soon. <laughs> Creative work and uh, yeah, it is. It is skin actually. actually. So, so that's, that's the creative, creative work. work, and then I've written forty thousand words that I'm submitting alongside that. Yeah. Have you had much response from people in Melbourne? No, um, I've got a few friends over there, but um, it hasn't come out over there yet. So, um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully, I've done it justice. <laughs> um. I'll quickly interject while you're thinking of more questions. But I want to know what your writing day looks like, Eliza, because you do have lots of different things juggling, you know, <laughs> your study as well as your actual fiction work, as well as um, the flower farm. W what does it look like for your day? Are you an up early person or are you a late writer? I have had to sort of relearn how to write since having a tiny little human and I've always really liked writing in just like really big chunks of time. Um, I can sit and just write for 12 hours straight. Um, but with a tiny human, that is not really a, <laughs> a, a thing that you can do. So um, I've had to relearn how to write and I have started writing after he goes to bed. So I do most of my writing from probably between 8 and 1 a.m. Wow, yeah. And I think the added bonus of that time for me is that I'm not going to be interrupted. I'm not going to have phone calls. I'm not going to have urgent emails come in. Um, I'm not going to get distracted by, you know, something outside or hanging out the washing. It's like the world kind of contracts at that time of the night. And, I mean, I've sort of toyed with being one of those bouncy writers that gets up really early to write, um, but I'd just be really scared that my toddler would wake up. And I wouldn't be able to put him, you know, if he wakes up at six, it's like, oh, well, you're kind of up for the day now. Whereas if he wakes up at like 10 o'clock, it's like, no, you're going back to sleep. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, I've sort of turned into a I late know. night person. I was actually watching something, an interview with Dean Brown, Dean Brown, the Da Vinci Code. And he was saying 4am, he sets his alarm every morning for 4am and he gets up and he writes. I think, wow, that's some serious commitment to get up at 4am, isn't it, to do that? But then, see, I couldn't stay up late and work until 1am either. Mm. It is, it's interesting the different way that people write, have got their own different processes in their brain. You can train it to function at a certain time mm. and do the writing. Yeah. Yeah, because I couldn't have written at that time um, prior to having a child. Like, I've really had to completely readapt my writing habits. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Have we got any more questions? <laughs> Jack has got one. Ah, 
Council. <laughs> yes, so um, Jock and I were on a residency together at the Australian Institute of Marine Science up in Townsville, and it was it was really lovely being there with other writers and being able to talk to the scientists and the researchers and getting that inside look at all the research it was just incredible. Um, I think what really struck me was how careful how careful the researchers are about what they put into the public space and how much that gets dragged around to serve different political agendas and how warped it becomes and you know what we as artists and creators can do to kind of become part of that dialogue in a meaningful way um, but yeah, that was that was an absolutely amazing experience. And was that the Varuna residency? Because I know that you're saying that you did a Varuna, or is that separate? separate? So this was through the um, Foundation for Australian Literary Studies, which is based up at the James Cook University. But um, yeah, I I was lucky enough to get a Varuna residential fellowship and then they have some fellowships that are just open for alumni so I got to go to Ireland for three weeks when Henry was one um, which was pretty incredible. <laughs> yeah that's fantastic. Mm. I saw a question coming from over in this direction. I think I've almost had to detach from that because it's so unpredictable and uncertain and I couldn't think of anything more disheartening than spending three years of my life or however long, you know, dedicated to writing something, you know, just on trend or ahead of the trend and then to find that it's just been, you know, there's it's an inundated area or, you know, it's not quite right. And so for me, I think the biggest thing has just been to preserve and cultivate the joy and to just do everything I can to eke every every bit of goodness from the process because the rest of it's just so unknown. And that's what I did with this book. I just kind of wrote what was meaningful to me and what, what felt most resonant and what intrigued me. Um, so it's been a really astonishing delight to have it resonate with other people. Mm. And I think, I think that's really interesting because by the time, um, if, if you're trying to chase a trend, by the time you've actually written the manuscript, that trend's gone and it's been replaced by something different, so. But I have to say, I think I kind of accidentally hit the witchcraft trend. I think there's been quite a few books that have written, you know, explored witches and drawn on that, so that, that was nice. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. And where can people find you online, Eliza? Where do you like to hang out if people want to find out more about your books and your writing? after they've gone home tonight and they think, oh, I forgot to ask Eliza this amazing question about her novel or her writing or a flower farm. How do people get in touch with you? Um, I'm on Instagram, probably most of all the social media sites. Twitter, I kind of go on and off because it's a bit overwhelming. Um, and you can also find my email on my website if you do have any questions about anything. But yeah, thank you so much for coming. It's um, been really lovely. No worries. Well, thank you, Eliza, for coming down to Port Ferry. And speaking about your beautiful book, Jo has plenty of copies of Salt and Skin in store. Now, don't forget that Christmas is coming up and books make the perfect gifts because they're easy to wrap and you can just, uh, you know, give them out willy-nilly and they look really, really professional. And you can also get a signed copy. So Eliza's got her lovely signing pen. She's happy to sign some. I'd like to thank everyone here for coming out tonight, um, spending your Saturday evening or afternoon talking books and writing with us. Thanks again to Jo for su hosting such wonderful events here at Blarney Books and always supporting Australian authors. And, yeah, again, thank you, Eliza, for coming. Oh, thank you. <laughs>